one thing I do remember I did differently and it wasn't just for the Olympics. It was for, you know, we had world championships every, um, three years. And then we also, I think the hardest races were actually our internal, um, national team races when we would just kick the shit out of each other. Um, all the girls that we were training with on the team, cause you, you knew everybody knew your weak spots and you knew theirs. And so those were the hardest races, but I would, those, those mornings, those hard morning, like peace mornings, I would look in the mirror and just, just kind of like self affirmation, I guess it, you, not that I think about it, uh, but it was just kind of something that just felt natural. It's just like, you got this. Uh. All right, welcome back to Lionheart Radio. I'm your host, Rick Alexander, founder of Lou Aviv in San Diego, California. And today I'm joined by multiple world champion, two time Olympic gold medalist, and coach at Power Speed Endurance. Aaron Cafaro McKenzie. Thanks for being on. Hey, Rick. Thanks. So as we were talking pre-interview, as serendipity would have it, your husband's interview uh, actually aired today with Brian McKenzie. Yep. So for the listeners, uh, and I think two-time Olympic gold medalist kind of speaks for itself, but for the listeners, can you kind of walk us through your athletic background, what got you into, you know, being into fitness and into sports in the first place? Yeah, sure. I guess... I was the kid that never dreamed or even thought they could uh, make it to the Olympics. So that wasn't even on my radar. Um, I actually started out dancing. Um, I did classical ballet for the first 12 years, my well, from two to 14, and got pretty competitive at that. And so I think, uh, you know, I have a lot to thank that discipline that that taught me, and obviously, you know, rhythm and flexibility. But that was my base. I was a dancer. And then, um, yeah, that got a little unhealthy as far as, you know, just body image. And, and it, it was, it was. I would say dancers are the most competitive athletes I've ever <laughs> really? been around. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, it's brutal. So I actually was having, but my brother always played every single sport growing up, you know, baseball, football, whatever. And so I would always, I had fun throwing a ball with him, you know, seeing how hard we could throw the ball and then, you know, the home run derby on the street. And so I got into softball. I think that was like, yeah, in, in around junior high. And then I uh, picked up basketball and I, I really, really liked basketball all through high school, but I, I actually, I was okay at it, but I wasn't great. I just, I loved the sport. It was just fun to me. Um, it was like, it, it was playing. And so when it came time to get, go to college, I really wanted to play in college, but I just didn't, I didn't have what it, what it took. And uh, so I was looking around at colleges to walk on to. For what? For basketball? For, for basketball. Yeah. For okay. basketball. Yeah. And uh, basically someone is uh, my dad suggested he's like you know there's this rowing thing that like kids are getting scholarships for without any experience why don't you try that and so I looked into it and started calling around in different colleges and just kind of it was like cold calling you know yeah Being like hey I'm a kid and from Modesto California I haven't taken a stroke in my life you want like can I come to your school and I got a lot of no's um sure. it's actually kind of uh a funny story now because I know all the head coaches that that were like yeah no because I'm actually pretty short when it comes to rowers so, so then you uh, must have been short for basketball as well yeah but you know I was I was a two guard so yeah. you know I was I was all right there's there's a there's a spot for me sure yeah <laughs> on the basketball team um yeah and, and, but rowing especially with you know scholarship like they if they want, are going to give a scholarship they're going to give it to a six foot something girl you know and they aren't going to give it to a five foot nothing girl so I uh fortunately the novice coach Sarah Nevin at Cal Berkeley called me back and um she invited me out to go into the launch which is like the coach's boat and yeah I I did a little mini tour and I, I loved it and you know I was so nervous that before you know I heard that there's this 2k race or like that there's this 2k distance mm -hmm. I had nothing about rowing and so I was like oh I should probably do a 2k before I like go watch practice you know and 
so I did one and they were talking, these, all these high school girls were talking about their scores. And I, I was like, Oh yeah, you know, I pulled this like 845 for 2000 meters, which on is the concept too. The concept too. Exactly. So that's kind of like the SAT of rowing. Right. Um, but yeah, the coach turned around and was like, never tell anybody that again. <laughs> <laughs> really? Um, okay. Got it. Uh, yeah. Cause I mean, I guess she was just going off my, uh, past athletic experience and, uh, yeah, that's not a, that's not a score you want to shout from the hilltops basically if you're on a competitive rowing team. Yeah, so, yeah. but I had, I should have done more research, but, uh, anyhow, so long story short, I think my, um, my background was non-specialized, you know, and I, and I think that actually made me set me up really well for rowing. Um, rowing needs a lot of endurance. You know, I actually, my basketball coaches made us do cross country in the off season and it needs rhythm it needs flexibility and it needs competitiveness. And I, and I had all of those from all the different, um, sports and, and just my upbringing. So yeah, I guess that's the long, long and short of it (laughs) of, uh, my non-specialized rowing background. Yeah, what's interesting is we had um, Sarah Hendershot on as well, and, oh, nice. and she talked about how one of the things that got her into rowing was uh, the fact that she could go to college and row as well. Yeah, well, it's the uh, it's probably number one on the list of, of parents, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> like, how do I get my kid into school one and then potentially paid for too? Right. So uh, another parallel is that she talked about that she's kind of small for rowing as well. So she said the way that she made up for it was kind of just work ethic and hard work. And I'm kind of, what was your approach um, as far as coming in, being a smaller athlete and having to make that up? Yeah, yeah. And I, um, you know, Sarah Sarah is a fantastic rower and and a great competitor for sure. And, uh, you know, I, I was there you know, the, the, the quad before her and what I learned from, from those girls, cause there's, there's always, uh, there's token short girls kind of like, you know, like on South Park, sure. yeah. <laughs> where were the tokens? Okay. Um, but so you learn what they do, like how do, how do these like outliers survive, you know? Mm-hmm. And there was a girl that was actually, you know, was on, um, Sarah's team on Princeton before, uh, uh Le- Leah Purnell and she, would outwork the shit out of anybody like she could just grind and go after she would just be doing extra Mm -hmm. all the time fortunately you know I I tried to do that I I broke myself a lot um trying to to play that game of outworking yeah because there's definitely a law of diminishing return when it comes to exactly well yeah um and you know I I think um if you are new to the sport, you kind of need some of those repetitions, um, to get familiar with it. But at, at some point you need, you're just not recovering. You know, you're already doing a full on training program. And then in addition, if you're trying to do more than that, then, um, that's where, that's where you kind of start crumbling. And so what my approach ended up being, um, to actually get onto the 2008 team, was to do things uh, to stop following the leader, per se. Mm-hmm. So stop following what people are doing and start feeling a little bit more and actually work on my own personal weaknesses. So for me, since I you know, was smaller, uh, it was strength. Like, how am I going to out-muscle or you know, like out-lever a six-foot-three, 200-pound girl? Like, it's just the law. Right, <laughs> you know? it's, just not, yeah, it's, it's not going to happen. Not, You're just going to do it more than more power. Happen. Yeah. So, um, so I just had to get smarter on how to use my body weight. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, basically, you know, my brother introduced me to CrossFit and he met one of the first places he went was CrossFit San Francisco or San Francisco CrossFit, I guess. And, uh, you know, Kelly, this guy by the name of Kelly Starrett was just one of the first, I think he was there like, you know, one of the top 10, uh, first 10 CrossFits and he was a budding, you know, PT student at the time. And he just took me under his wing and, um, was like, girlfriend, you have no ass. We need to teach you how to squat. We need to teach you how to do a push up, and we need to teach you how to do a pull up. And that was the basics of it of like, I'm not going to 
try to tell you how to row. I'm going to try to teach you how to move, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, how I understand it is the U.S., um, the the team, the rowing team had a very primitive outlook uh, as far as like toward lifting at the time. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, the coaches, uh, the rowing coaches are rowing coaches um, and they, they know their sport very well. But there's, you know, I, I think as, as humans, like if you if you do so many repetitions of the same movement, it's really hard to change that habit. Yeah. So you got to find another stimulus to, you know, make a connection. And for me, it was using CrossFit and just doing something completely different outside of the boat rather than just trying to bang my head against the wall and try to change, you know, something or try to be uh, someone who I wasn't, which mm-hmm. was not 6'3", 200 pounds. <laughs> so, right, right. so when uh, you started experimenting with these other things like CrossFit on the outside, and there started to be a crossover and like a real transition effect where it did mm-hmm. it catch on or were people still reluctant as far as lifting and adding in CrossFit to the rowing? Well, it was, it was kind of like a, uh, it was kind of like a cow cowboy experiment. I, I don't know how else to explain it, but I was the only one doing it. It was kind of like a secret experiment. Um, and it was crazy. Like People are like, why the hell would you do that? Like, you know, and it was, just, it was more volume on top of our already full program. Again, like we would be doing at least, you know, 20 to, to 30K a day of rowing. Um, well, actually 20 to 40K. But, um, you know, it was, a, it was a massive experiment. There was uh, only a couple people that would, you know, every now and then join me for something. But I, uh, it was the fall of 2008 and everybody, it was kind of, everybody was kind of just, scrambling and trying to figure out how to get on the freaking team and so too many people weren't really worried about what I was doing until I started uh really doing well like I was I went from the bottom of the uh the totem pole to uh yeah I I remember that spring there I just I couldn't lose and and to be honest it wasn't I don't know if it was necessarily that I, I got stronger I think I just became more aware of how to use my body weight and even more so how to teach my partner or whoever is in the boat with me how to use their body weight more effectively. Because again, I'm not going to be able to outpower someone who's just designed like a, uh, a freak of nature. Yeah, no, I think, uh, more than anything, it, it that was like the first piece of, uh, me understanding how to be a coach and had, you know, the power of, of, using your body weight and using, you know, not just concentrating on yourself, but whoever else is in the boat with you. Yeah. So 20 to 40,000 K a day makes me want to puke on a rower. That sounds awful. How much uh, training outside of that could you really get in as far as like CrossFit and stuff? Oh, it would, you know, some, some weeks it would be maybe one thing, you know, Okay. other, other weeks it would be, I, I would just do set up, a, like a little Cindy like thing, you know, it would be like push ups, pull ups, and air squats. My favorite go to actually, like a finisher after a workout, would always be just go into uh, the gym that was above the boathouse and just do one minute handstand holds and one minute hollow rocks mm. for 10 minutes. And it's like, that's CrossFit. I think what CrossFit is known for is like just crazy skull crushing workouts. But yeah. like, I think CrossFit whatever it's a it's a word that means many can mean many different things but right. how i interpreted it was filling your hole and that was my hole like yeah. my hole was body weight awareness and just uh you know strength and it was either some body weight or just adding five by fives or five by three deadlifts mm-hmm. just getting exposure to something completely different stimulus that i had gotten in the boat so so is that approach of kind of just finding your weakness is finding a gap in your fitness and literally just working on that? Totally. Yeah, that's very cool. Now, when you're doing that much volume, and I'm just assuming, but your, I would think your diet and stuff would have to really be dialed in in order to reduce inflammation and, and, and really everything to reduce stress markers would really have to be uh, very dialed in and in order to get away with doing that much volume and not breaking yourself. Yeah. Well, that pretty much was the difference between my uh, 2008 quadrennium is what, you know, 
they call it, four years of training up to 2008 and then 2012. I think I could get away with a lot more shit um, in 2008. I was, shoot, how old was I? I think I was like 23, 24. Yeah. I just, I remember when I finally made the team, they, we were sponsored by like Kellogg's or, uh, you know, one of the cereal companies. Oh, really? And they sent us this whole box of like cereal and we would just crush like cereal and like, and I, I, you know, I would, would be like, oh yeah, I'm totally paleo, but crush cereal on the side, you know? Right. I think you just get away with shit when you're younger. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, after just where the wear and tear and, and uh, on your body um 2012 era I just couldn't get away with it I just kept on breaking um I actually had to miss a world championships the year before 2012 because I had broken two ribs <laughs> how do you break a rib um, really well you can feel it a mile away it's basically um it's a stress fracture so, okay. so but like it torso. starts out you know yeah Simplified, it's basically your your muscles are, are you're very tight, especially around your lat and subscap and all of that. And there, those are just glued down to your ribs, and then you're breathing hard. And so your ribs, or your your lungs and, and diaphragm or everything are pushing on the inside, and there's nowhere for your ribs to go. And so they just take the stress and and break. The fundamental reason that I I believe is that, um, especially as a you know shorter rower your shoulders out of position. So if you're reaching and in, in any bit internal, you're just exposing all of those, you know, that area that, that just gets so tight. You just, after how many strokes, thousands of strokes a day, right, right. Okay. no matter how much mobility you do, you can't undo it. So yeah, I think that's where I, I basically got a big kick in the ass of like, hey, you're going to have to change your technique and you're going to have to do something else, like change your diet because you're breaking. Sure. So what was the, the what lifestyle factor, and, and maybe you alluded to it with diet, but what did you control the most that made the biggest impact as far as your recovery and, and things like that? Starting to date my husband. Yeah. <laughs> Brian. Yeah. Well, because he's, he's on the cutting edge of all, like he's the one, I feel like he figures, he messes with stuff, finds out what works, and then everybody else kind oh, of yeah. starts to adopt it. Oh, he's such a good tinker. Yeah. It, it drives me nuts. But, um, yeah, no, that's uh, – he – I guess Kelly actually introduced us in 2010. And the first thing he said was when I, w- I was actually injured. And he was like, hey, I have a buddy down there. He's going to, he's gonna, you know, review with you how to squat and push and pull again. But don't make out with him. <laughs> and I was like, okay, okay like yeah. whatever. So then uh, he gave Brian the same thing. But yeah, it was he was like, I'm, you're introducing me to a coach. Like, I'm not going to make out with a freaking coach. <laughs> we had, you know, semi kept in touch. Um, he helped me out that day. Um, I went to one of his seminars. But he, in 2012, I was coming back through for uh, our Olympic training camp. I was driving from Northern California down to the Mexico border basically where the training center is and uh, Brian lives in Orange County and I called him up and I was like hey I'm coming through I think you know you probably kill me if I didn't come and stop and say hi and so he's like yeah come over for dinner and and it it was just weird it was just kind of like he wasn't a coach anymore he was just uh, a friend and he you know from then on he actually moved out to Princeton with me for those next uh, six months leading up to uh, London and literally put me under a microscope and gave me spoonfuls of coconut oil, would cook. Um, he did my laundry. I mean, this is probably the side most people don't really know about Brian, but, um, dude, he was a, he was a trooper. Yeah. He, uh, just, he cooked what he wanted me to be fueled with. Um, and it was predominantly shifting to a fat adapted diet, not saying that I didn't eat carbs cause you know, you can't take away chips and guacamole from me, but, yeah. um, it so, was so ketogenic diet. Fat. Okay. No. Um, because I was de- never in ketosis. Um, cause I, I mean, we just had way too much volume. Um, and you know, rowing is 2000 meters. It is a sprint. And so we, it, yeah. I, I don't think it, actually is a sport that's really 
you know, if you're ultra runner, fucking go for it. Be ketogenic. Um, but if you're a middle distance sprinter, it's very um, demanding of that, that high output power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're doing, you know, one minute on one minute off, you know, yeah. type of things. And it's just, yeah. Uh, so, um, but yeah, we just became pretty much like meat eating vegetarians, um, with okay. a spoonfuls of coconut oil. That's all I can remember. Um, it was, I, I don't know why I don't, I don't, I don't mind coconut, but the, uh, just a spoonful of it was gnarly. Right. So you just increase fat. <laughs> Uptake in Increase to... fat. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. Um, and, you know, women kind of have a cheating way to tell if you are, uh, if you're healthy or not. And that's uh, basically if you have your menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it was weird. It was almost like a badge of honor um, of like, oh, you're training so hard that you don't have your menstrual cycle. And, and when in fact, um, you know, you that's that actually the biggest... Too that's the biggest sign that you aren't recovering and that you aren't maximizing the, hor we're just, you know, walking hormones basically, you know, and, and especially if you're an athlete, you want all of your hormones to be working for you. Mm -hmm. Um, and so once I up my fat, lo and behold, I became healthy and got menstrual cycle back and might be TMI, but that was like, Oh, okay. Like this is my kind of like test to know that I'm like recovering again. Right. And your hormones are actually working how they should, right? Because that would be the biggest issue with not having it is that it's not actually not having it. It's the, That's a symptom. But the problem is your, your actual hormone release. For sure. Yeah. For sure. So do you still, uh, do you still eat that way or has your, uh, has your thinking kind of evolved? Um, I, you know, I, I think everything should come in, in waves and I, uh, I definitely be, was became very like Nazi like um, about my eating habits. I mean, that's not a PC word to use. Um, <laughs> it's okay. But it's very strict. <laughs> okay. Very strict with my eating habits. Yeah, I'm like one eighth Jewish, so I can say that, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyhow, but I, yeah, we moved up to Oregon a few months ago, and it's just fun, like. I, I feel like you can experience culture through food. And so I didn't want to like limit myself through it. I mean, mm. I've never, I've really never drank in beer in my life, but I'm drinking beer now. And you know, like there's freaking homemade sprouted bread and I'm like, great, let's do it. And it's, I also think it's, it's interesting to just feel things. Like if you are so stuck on one way of eating, you almost forget what it feels like otherwise you know and sure and i also think sometimes you're easier to kill <laughs> you're, yeah. you're like i'm allergic to this i'm allergic to that i'm like i don't i don't know if i if i want to live that way like i feel like it's it's in, and you know what when we would travel for um rowing i knew that really we would have not the the choices would be limited and we would have to eat a lot of like processed carbohydrates so i would start introducing it to my diet before we travel, mm -hmm. so I wouldn't get sick while competing. But yeah, you're obviously there's an optimal human diet, but if if you you can't be so sensitive that you have to eat a certain way all the time, else I think that that gets into your lifestyle, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think being dogmatic about anything is just not sustainable, too. And if mm -hmm. you do sustain it, you just kind of look like an elitist asshole, <laughs> just right? Yeah. But yeah. It's yeah, something that even I think Brian alludes to in his new book, which is like, yeah, you have to be able to, you have to expose yourself to stresses, right? Otherwise, you won't be able to deal with them, and mm -hmm. you're inevitably in life going to deal with them. And I'm paraphrasing a lot here, but yeah, yeah, yeah. no, that's pretty much what it says, and and I and I totally agree with that. And I think that's like the trippiest part to me about like you know everybody, and I and I think what my team and I accomplished at the Olympics was was great and it and it is amazing it, it took a lot of freaking hard gnarly days in a row to train for that but i just can't at, at the end of it like after 2012 i just couldn't imagine doing another cycle because i'm just like i'm used to this stress if that makes sense like sure. i just felt like i just wasn't evolving and so i think that not only is it important you know 
with food lifestyle, but it, it like also what what your goals are in life. Like you just gotta you gotta got constantly evolve if you want to, if you want to grow. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's okay if you don't want to grow too. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah. But but that, and that's the thing I think like really evolving it, it you have to you have to level up and you have to grow, but that's relative to where you're at in life, right? Like there's always another. There's always comfortable, even if comfortable for you is, you know, nuts to somebody else. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, and I, and I think that's the um, that's actually the biggest lesson that I've had to learn is is actually being okay with where I am right now, you know, and like because it was always like you can do more, you can do better. It's not good enough. It's not good enough. It's never good enough. And it's like that gets you. Sure, that gets you to the top of the podium. But then what, you know, like you still have those, you get onto the top of the podium and you know what you say, <laughs> this isn't good enough. I want another one. Right. So yeah, I think it's, it's just, I, I call it chasing dragons. It's this mystical creature that you're always going to be chasing after and you, you can't catch it. Yeah. And, and that's the problem too, I think with really living for a result instead of a process, right? Because a result is so short-lived no matter how amazing of a result mm-hmm. it is. So being dialed in and tuned in and like really enjoying that process, no matter what that looks like, I think is just a better recipe for, you know, being happy anyway. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It's actually kind of a good segue. One of the things Brian talked about was making huge life changes every three months in order to like really challenge his ways of thinking and grow. I'm sure that every three months isn't like, hey, every 90 days we're we're fucking or, shit up or around every, here. Every day from his from his wife. Yeah, so that's what I was gonna ask. I was gonna say, like, what's your uh, I guess kind of outlook on that philosophy? I thought it was cool. And you know what the cool thing about that with him is is that like I don't think it's a necessarily like conscious decision. I think he just he just feels you know feels things so well, and and that's one of the things that I admire so so much about him is that he is so good at feeling and then also describing that feeling. And I think that that's helped so many people because he's, he shares, you know, um, his experiences. And I think that is, uh, I, I'm kind of on the other end of the spectrum of, I like to grind and, um, I don't mind suffering. Like it doesn't feel, suffering doesn't feel for the most part, like horrible to me mm. <laughs> or pain, I guess pain, I guess that might be a better, way to describe it. Like I, I'm not scared of pain. So I, I will ignore feeling and, and push through things a lot more than he will. So he, he doesn't like pain and that's totally normal, but I guess that's, that's the yin and yang. He's uh yeah, he is very sensitive. And uh, with that, he has the superpower of evolving and adapting mm-hmm. and I am not as sensitive. And so I push through things at any cost uh you know old rowing my college rowing coach his my favorite quote is he's like yeah Aaron would row through a brick wall and and that's kind of how it is but it doesn't you know that's that feels satisfying to me like I I like feeling that's that's my feeling like I like to feel pain because then I know that's the threshold like sometimes I think that's why my my athletic career was laden with injury is because I like to know my limits almost, Mm -hmm. you know, like how much can I actually put up with? Like, yeah, if you're going to tell me to stop, I'm not going to stop. But if I have to, because I'm broken, then okay, that's my limit. (laughs) Are you religious or do you come from a religious background? I was raised as a uh, Catholic, holiday Catholic, pretty much. But my dad, yeah, my dad's very, very Catholic. And so I had, you know, first baptism, first communion, but yeah, no, it never really resonated with me too much, but I always, I don't know. I feel like my, my religion is, is nature mm-hmm. and it's, that sounds very hippie. Maybe organs gotten to me, you know, <laughs> but I, uh, I, I do, I do believe in a higher power. I think, I think you kind of have to, to stay humble, mm-hmm. you know? Sure. Yeah. And I know that sounds like a really weird question for the podcast, but the reason I'm asking is because I'm. I'm curious about, I'm always curious when you find people who have a really, like an affinity to suffer, right? Because it's a quality that will make you a really good endurance athlete to a point. And I'm always just curious of uh, what what it is that, that's common among people that can suffer for a really long time. So, hmm. 
I don't know where that goes. Yeah, I mean, it's a really darn good reason why. You know, like I think that uh, to have this like belief that someone thinks that you are, you know, infinitely capable and powerful and, and just to feel like you always have someone on your side. Like I always, there, I had a lot of teammates that were religious and I almost was like, shit, I want that guy on my side too, yeah, <laughs> you know? Right, right. Um, so I can, I can kind of see that of like, you know, when you're getting low, you, you always are like, no, well, you know, he believes in me or, you know, and right, right. basically, I mean, without getting too religious, cause I'm sure this might be, you know, it's, it's always a touchy subject, but yeah. I, I really think that the shift in, in believing that you actually hold the power and that you, uh, or not the power, I think that's actually the opposite word I wanted. I think that, that you are the strength. You are, um, it's not someone else. It's not someone else giving it to you. You create it it's yours and it's there for the taking. Like, it's not like, you know, one person has, has more strength or, you know, whatever than, than the other. I think everybody has it within them and that they're just so scared to almost own it, um, that they have to attribute it to another, another thing or another cause or, you know, a higher being. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely understand what you're saying. I'm just like that self-reliance kind of thing. Right. Yeah. 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 So you've been at the top of a sport, well, the very top of a sport. What is the biggest separating factor? Because there's a lot of people that would uh, love to go to the Olympics. And I think what happens is the people that make it, they get a platform and they tell people, like, you should just follow your passion or whatever. And so it's really easy for people to step back and be like, Aaron Kafaro is an Olympic gold medalist. Like, I want to be an Olympic gold medalist. What do you think the biggest separating factor between people that succeed in their sport and people that don't is? that you've seen? I think it, it might have to do with passion or just might have to do with stubbornness. <laughs> okay. um, I think I think people who succeed are used to hearing no and are okay with hearing no and okay with failing. To be honest, that's, that, that's, that's the only thing that comes to mind of like, if there's something that gets in your way that will, that will set you off and you're like, oh, this isn't for me, well then, yeah, no, it's not. But when you really want to achieve something, there's going to be a lot of no's and there's going to be a lot of like, you shouldn't be doing this or a lot of you can't. And that's just the difference between, I think, someone who, whether it's a sport or, you know, in business or even in life, like that just is continues to go whether other people believe in them or not, you know, mm-hmm. and, and that doesn't mean you don't have self doubt because that is all too rampant. Yeah, just part <laughs> but, of it. And I think that's actually the, um, that might be the biggest misnomer of, of them all, of like, you know, people thinking that all of, all of everybody is so self-confident um, who achieves something great. And I think, and it, you know, drive my husband nuts because I'm always like, oh, I can't do this. Like, this is so hard. Like, I, I just, I don't know. Like, well, I don't know if I'm going to do it. And then I just, continue to do it you know it's like yeah you you actually probably still complain about it but you you wake up the next morning and you get after it again Mm -hmm. and I think that is to me the biggest uh separator is just continuing to go yeah so it's like the doubts there but at the same time it's like you don't let it bring you down yeah like you're still moving (laughs) and then it's like no I shouldn't be moving but I'm you know like no stop moving and but you just keep moving you know yeah absolutely so, so much of your life had to have been dedicated to the sport over the course of a decade or more. So when that sport ended, uh, and I know you, you're into the power speed endurance thing now because you're, you're a coach, and I know you had a lot to do with the setting up of the PSE Pro program launching. But I'm curious, mm-hmm. uh, what, what we can talk a little bit about what that transition was like to go from essentially pro athlete and this being everything in my life to... Uh, kind of having to fill that void with with other things yeah it was gnarly and kind of like what we were talking about before of like I wasn't used to any other stress besides training stress and as amazing of an accomplishment as it was like I still got to take naps (laughs) I still got to like I slept you know nine to 14 hours a day and working and 
and being uh, an adult and adulting, um, you typically don't get those things. <laughs> you know, naps and three, you know, plus meals and, you know, at least six hours of sleep at night. And so that it just is a game changer. And I, yeah, I, I definitely have had some really good conversations with former teammates and then also a lot of vets that have helped me through kind of the, the transition and just trying to find find my groove again and you know I don't I don't know if I've, I've if I'm actually in a groove um, but all I know is that I'm I'm moving again whereas right after 2012 to you know I think right up into last year like there were days where I, I couldn't move at all. And, it, and it's just it's such a weird feeling. And whether, you know, I think hormones have a lot to do with it for sure. You just, you know, put your body through the ringer. But I think, you know, there's also the piece of you're just being separated from your tribe and your purpose and you're, and you have these new stresses and you don't know how to deal with it. But um, yeah, it's, it's been an interesting journey and I, I don't, I think um, a lot of athletes are too, including myself, are scared to talk about it because it's like, oh, <laughs> poor you. Like, you had to take naps and you had to go to, like, parties and, you know, be the, the guest speaker and, like, whatever. But um, I think maybe if we look at it from a biological basis, like, your your body is a little fucked up after, and especially, you know, from what I've seen with, with rowers, like, yeah, their bodies are beaten up mm. afterwards and it takes a toll on you mentally, um, for sure. You know, sure you have little aches and pains. Um, but I think the biggest piece is just mentally and internally, you know, yeah. some, something's going on in there. And, and I think that's, that's something that I've been and looking more and more into. And I don't, because I don't know how to help the next generation, and it's always my hesitancy. I, I actually have a really <laughs> hard time encouraging people to go to the next level and go to the Olympics. And like, you know, I've kind of separated myself from from the rowing scene because I'm just like, God, I don't want anybody to go and feel like I did after. Um, I, w- I would never wish that upon anyone. Sure, I would wish, you know, someone getting a gold medal and, and getting, you know, that that feeling for sure. But I I don't know if the trade off for me, at least my experience and the way I dealt with it, like that pain afterwards and and whatever was going on with my body and still is going on with my body. I don't know if it's, if it was worth it. Mm. Um, and I, and I think it can be if, if there's a better transition solution. Yeah. I think transition is a really hard thing for a lot of people. Uh, I think I'm, kind of intimately familiar with this right now because I'm transitioning out of the military at the end of the year. Um, and so I've gone through a couple programs and stuff and it, it's just something that I, I'm realizing a lot of per- percentages of the population can deal with because change management, it's a difficult, it's a very complex thing. You know, you have the physical aspect and the mental aspect and there's a lot, a lot that goes into it and it's scary, you know? Totally. So have you found that, what, what have you found, I guess, that helps with the mental aspect of it? For example, and I don't really know because I haven't made the transition yet from the military. But one of the yeah. things that people talk about a lot is having a routine, having a habit. And I'm just curious, yeah. like having that morning routine, for example, uh, will help keep you grounded, even though all these other things around you are shifted. I'm, ch- I'm just curious if you found something like that. Yeah, I, I, I bet that I bet that does. <laughs> <laughs> Probably I, would I, help. <laughs> You know, I, I've done a little bit of everything, to be honest. Um, and I'm I'm not someone that just changes from one fad to the next but I you know I've tried to eat again like I tried to stay super clean I tried to um you know have a regimented day of like you do this at 6 a.m you do this at 7 a.m um none of that like I feel like it's like an alcoholic going to cigarettes (laughs) you're just changing one addiction to the next and yeah we are if anything we are creatures of habit for sure. I think that is the most fundamental thing. Like we, we don't, we dislike change. We like comfort. And so I think it, it actually is just for me, it, it has been finding a couple people to talk to 
and um, doing some meditation and almost just being um, and not having a, a schedule per se, but just being and like not having to do something or not having to be someone. I think that's been my most grounding thing for my transition, uh, to be honest. And mm. it's it's so hard because it's like we're so used to doing something. It's like, oh, you need to be here or, you, you, or being told what to do, you know. Yeah. And it's almost like being okay with like the silence and and the uh, and being you know, like okay with yourself. Yeah, it's just almost like letting go of that persona. Mm-hmm. So you're with. Uh, I know you had a lot to do. We we even pushed this interview back a little bit because of the Power Speed Endurance Pro launch that you guys just did. Yeah, yeah, you, it's kind of uh, <laughs> that was that was a mini Olympics. <laughs> yeah. So with yeah, a product launch in a in a company, I can attest to is yeah. Hell. <laughs> um, yeah. So we didn't talk too much about it with Brian when he was on. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about PSC Pro, like what it is and and kind of what your role is? Yeah, for sure. Um, so PSC um, is a acronym for Power Speed Endurance, and it, it's the name of um, Brian's first book, actually. And it's basically going over the fundamentals of movement of sports um, and some of the basic sports like running, biking, swimming, rowing. And uh, it, it's just treating, you know, it's, it's basically giving you a guide on how to perform a sport and, you know, efficiently and, um, effectively. And what we see in those sports is a lot of injury and everybody, you know, again, here's the repetition thing. Everybody, you know, wants, wants the repetitions, which is fine, but what is missing in a lot of, um, I guess not just sport, but a lot of, a lot of skill is, or a lot of, uh, things is actual skill. And so here, here is, uh, he's laid out, here's the skill of this sport. So you have a good foundation and that's, um, pretty much what we've carried on and carried through, um, with power speed endurance is just providing a, a guide for skill for sports. And so now, um, you know, as a rower, I actually learn the most from Olympic lifting coaches and from, um, running coach like Brian and from Kelly who, who who knew nothing about the sport. And so I think what we're doing here is actually bringing together some top minds in the sport. Um, and we're providing guides for, you know, a program for that sport, but also these coaches are coming together and talking about what works in their sport, um, and what doesn't, you know, and, and, and learning from other sports. And so, uh, that, that's, I think one of the coolest parts of it is is that it's not just we aren't just stuck in tradition you know like of course we have a good basis of fundamentals and principles because that's you know the foundation for everything but um we always want to evolve our thinking and be open to learning from other sports and from our athletes and from other coaches so Mm -hmm. Long story short, yeah, it's it's programming, but it's more of like a guide and and a constantly evolving guide because we're always learning more about how to move a little bit better. But uh, yeah, I, I think it, it, this is a beast that's going to continue to evolve, and I I'm, I don't even know how to, it's kind of funny. It's it's almost like the rowing. I, I never really dreamed of uh, being in charge of a, you know, a, a operating company. Um, it just kind of happened, and it's happening. And it's, you know, there, there's obviously probably would have been easier if I went to uh, business school <laughs> sure. um, uh, and all of that. But it's, I, I think there's something that Brian and I both agree on very fundamentally that that we need to share this information with athletes so that they aren't, you know, continually running into walls. Um, and like I did, you know, and rowing, like trying to follow someone else's program because I thought that's what just rowers did. I Mm -hmm. thought you just worked hard and that was it. And it's like, Oh no, you can actually do, you can actually like work on your skill and, you know, become a well-rounded athlete and that will help you become a better rower like mm-hmm. what 
you know, and so it's, it's just providing solutions that's a little bit alter- alternative to the typical sport solution. So, so if, if I went on there and I found like PSE, the, the swim program, for example, it's not a mm-hmm. templated program, right? It's well, like, what am I there's, actually getting? Yeah. So there's a daily, there's a daily program and every cycle. So it's a, we do like a nine week cycle, you know, active recovery. And so there is three days of um, strength and conditioning that is targeted for that, that sport. Okay. So you know, say for rowers, we're really going to work on developing that posterior, you know, your backside because you're sitting on your ass all day. Um, and it actually, you're in flexion a lot. And so we need to develop a stronger posterior. And so it's just honing in. Um, it's kind of like what you were mentioning with Sarah of like, uh, you know, that the strength and conditioning for rowing is a little ancient still. And it's like, no, well, it doesn't have to be just take the fundamentals of the sport and, you know, apply some basic, uh, strength and conditioning principles to it. So, um, that's three days a week on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, strength and conditioning. And then, um, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday is a mix of intervals and, uh, just a stamina session. Hmm. So, you know, and you can, you can go for, it's, it's, it's like the CrossFit endurance model, um, except for a little bit more in depth. Okay. So you'll you'll find, um, you know, I think what CrossFit endurance was before was just intervals and um, you know some strength conditioning, but it was mostly like here's some intervals to try out, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, to add to your to your CrossFit. Well, here's we're giving actual sport athletes ideas for strength and conditioning now. Um, while also, you know, we still have a, a good CrossFit contingent that comes to us to help round out their, their program. Hmm. So um, to have, to right. have that many sports specific, uh, you guys must have just been sitting there writing out programming, <laughs> a shitload of programming to have that much in-depth sports specific type programs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's, uh, we're trying to find, uh, speaking of efficiency, we're trying to find the, uh, you know, in a, another efficient way uh, of, enter, of entering this all in and, and providing and sharing it with everyone. But um, right now it's worth it because uh, from what we, you know, if someone actually is doing the program, they, they feel a difference. And, you know, that, that's what makes it all worth it at the end of the day is that if you're actually helping someone realize that they can do the sport they love like especially runners like that's that's the biggest one we see is like I thought I you know I was told I can't run another day in my life and they come and and do our programming and um you know and, and they are like I'm running again this is great yeah you know and it's like we 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 all we all need to move and so here's options on how to continue to move and, and play and and do what you love so who knows our we're, we're always evolving, but you know, right now we're really playing around with the breathing aspect and preparation, um, for your sport, um, through breathing, not just warming up the muscular system, you mm-hmm. know? And I, I think that's something that's profound. Like, well, why not? Yeah. Like, why didn't we think of this before? <laughs> yeah. I'm doing it right now, actually, since the, since the Brian interview, I've been adding in these breathing techniques and, uh, dude, I'm like addicted to it. Good. Good. Yeah, no. And, and, you know, the biggest thing is, is do you feel a difference? You know, we don't want to sell a program just to be like, this is the best program ever. I think everybody feels something different. Um, Mm -hmm. and everybody's looking for something different out of, out of their movement practice or even out of their life. And so this is just our solution to help, help people, you know, train for something. And, you know, for, for me, like I, I just, I know the volume, the volume program works, but where it put me, you know, mentally and, and physically and hormonally afterwards, like I, I I don't, again, I don't wish that upon anyone. (laughs) So here's, here's a, you know, I have a rowing program that I'm trying to get out to, uh, you know, high schoolers, college kids, um, you know, as much as I can, because I, I just, it pains me to see how much volume they think is necessary to, for a 2000 meter sport. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's going to be a fine line between systematizing 
that process that you have and then in sacrificing quality, right? Totally, yeah. So the Lionheart Kicker is the final question. We ask it to uh, all of our guests, or at least we try to. And uh, the question is, based on everything that you've done so far, all the experience that you've gotten with the Olympics, with being a coach, uh, with everything, school, if you could give advice and it was guaranteed that everybody in the world would hear it uh, and it would be translated to every language, they might not all follow it, but they would definitely hear what you said. Uh, what would you tell people? Don't try to be the superstar. <laughs> what do you mean by um, that? I, I think that by using your team and, and supporting the people around you, you will go faster than you ever could on your own. And I think a lot of people just try to constantly self-improve, self-improve, which is great because it will, you know, you'll be more valuable player to the team, but you will never uh, go any faster or any stronger than, than the team around you. So um, I think yeah, I don't don't try to be the superstar, you know, just boost everyone up mm-hmm. around you. Mm. Yeah, I like that. It's kind of that, that mentality of like just trying to make yourself more useful. Uh. Yeah. Yeah, and so it's it's like you're you're just a piece of a piece of the team. Maybe I'm like brainwashed from being a rower, but it really is nailed into us that it's like if you think you can go fast, sure, go sit in a in a single by yourself. And even then, like, you're going to need a coach, you're going to need training partners, whatever, like you're, you're never going to go fast or, um, achieve, you know, do whatever you want to do just by your, by yourself. Um, you can, you can do 10 times more if you just boost, if you, if you're part of a team and you boost them up too, yeah. bring them along. Yeah, absolutely. That's good advice. I like it. Aaron, thanks for being on today. I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, buddy. Thanks, Rick. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to Lionheart Radio. I hope that the information from today's show will make you fitter, happier, and healthier. For the show notes of this episode and every episode, head to www.lionheartrad.io. Yep, just like Lionheart Radio. And please, if you have the time, head over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating. It really helps us to know that we're on the right track in delivering you reliable information and value. As always, feedback is welcome. If you have any comments on the show or like to suggest a guest, Send me an email at rick at louisvive.com. That's L-U-A-V-I-V-E.com. Thanks for your support, and we will see you next time. Bitch, I feel good. Don't I look stupendous? My shine is so endless, and shit you can do to end this. Even when I'm dead, niggas still gon' bump that chip shit. Coke, white, escalate on cinches for you dipshit. So you won't forget this. Midwest, nigga, be the coldest. Cleveland,